Hello and welcome to another Helen Ponton Veterans Video Blog Live, where we answer your questions and you guys give us all kinds of information as well. I'm here, Matthew Hill with Carol Ponton. It's good to be back with you, Carol. Yep. It's been a while. Um, we're excited to be here. And what we're going to start doing, a new tradition of sorts, is we're going to start by answering a couple questions that were submitted on our newsletter. Um, there is a way for you to sign up. Ah, oh, it's in the chat. You can sign up for the newsletter if you haven't, but every week we we ask for questions and and we're going to start this uh, Q&A off with a couple questions we got from there. So, Nate, what do we have? <clears throat> All right. I just want to know if I qualify for reimbursement for college tuition for my dependent. My claim was completed and placed me at 100 percent as of January 31st, 2024, going back to my initial claim in 2012. What do you say? Yes. Any any college between 2012 and now should be covered up to age 26 for your dependents. Great question. All right. Currently, I am 100 percent P&T and attempting to gain next status of special K. But my text interview did not excite whomever does the math. My guess is the fact that your end result does not share in the first 100 percent. Huh. Well, not sure what that is. Uh, special K, I'm assuming, is special monthly compensation K, which is loss of use of an organ. You can actually get that in addition to 100. You can get that in addition to any rating. You don't have to have 100 uh, percent. And you can, is what, seven different ones or? there? I don't know how many different ones there, there you, are. You can, you can get a lot of different uh, loss of use of organs. It's each loss of use is, is, a, is a different special monthly compensation K, which is about 100 and. $30 a month or something like that, in addition to whatever you're receiving? Oh, I'm not quite sure what your question is, but maybe it is. Remember, if you get, say, loss of use of erectile dysfunction, that's a 0% rating, but they pay you the extra money under the SMC. So if you're looking at it and you're seeing a 0%, that doesn't mean that you're not getting any money. Right. Okay. That means that it's, but it's, it's they just say they're spent paying it through the SMCK. So if you're getting another, I think it's around $130 a month, then you are being paid correctly if they awarded you that. But I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm not quite sure what your question is. All right. Well, let's jump into the questions of the day. From Dwayne, hey, H&P, describe the process to file a car within 90 days, 30. excuse me, 30 days of decision. This is Carol's bread and butter right here. Yeah. So when you get the note, when you get a decision, you've got 30 days from the, from notice, the regional office, from the region, 30 days from the notice of award to file a request for a higher level review. Um, so make sure, first of all, that you can file a higher level review. Sometimes what you decision you're getting is a higher level review. So you can't do that. It's only if you filed an initial claim, they denied you. And so the next step is a higher level review. You get that in within 30 days and you need to say car at the top or claim accuracy review and that way they'll know to pick it up and how how what would you say your success has been with that well it's you know the va office is never great but right. I, I you get a lot more success on that on things like a lot of times when a veteran gets a bva decision and they grant them certain service connections say ptsd a lot of times the regional office will give them an effective date of last month and so when you file for a higher level review on that then that person is going to go back to when you uh, began that appeal that ended up with the BVA grant. Those kind of things, you're almost, they're like 90% you're mm -hmm. going to get. Or if they gave you a 0% rating, you have a much higher chance of if, say, the board that sent this back gave you, granted it, PTSD, the first level gave you 0%. On a higher level review card, you're much more likely to get a higher rating, um, whether it's HLR or CAR, because they realize i got to go back and actually look at the evidence. Right. Old soldier, first to two. Which appeal is best for challenging effective date of TDIU? Previously raised in a DBQ by examiner and recognized by VA, VRO, who asked if IU was raised by BET. No reply by examiner. Was awarded TDIU in 2022. Okay, let's go back to the first part. Um... Well, I'm hoping this is something you just received and, and, and it would be best resolved on a direct appeal. I would ask for a higher level review because the evidence is in there and you just want to argue that it should have been decided in that prior claim. Uh, that's what. Yeah, I'm not quite sure w where you are in the process, but now that the VA, the BVA has gotten 
really starting to push these cases out, their decisions. If you have a basis for advancing on the docket, I might consider going to the board. Uh, if you're 75 or have any uh, homeless, um, anything that will get you advanced, I think I'd go there hmm. rather than wait around because you know they're still going to take six months, a year to make this decision. I would not go supplemental. I think we could agree on that. I would not go no. supplemental because you don't really have any new evidence. You, you want them to use the evidence that was already there. Right. Airborne Trooper, good to see you. First filed or filed PTSD increased to 100%. BES sent multiple DBQs for other direct service connected disabilities. Why would examiner add additional DBQs when they already had directed service connection? I didn't file for increase on those. Uh, this is. Uh, this is like asking the wind why, <laughs> why it blows harder in some places than others. I I, I don't know. I, I mean that I don't have anything good to say on that. <laughs> Not either. impressed with these contractors. No, contractors. Well, the, he said the BES did send all these. Yeah, and but they the were probably BES asked for by the raider. That's true. So. Well, e either way, it's a uh, a waste. Yes, Jim. When I retired in 97, never filed a claim. In 98, got a letter from the VA saying 10% for sinusitis and denied hearing loss. Do I now file supplemental or a new claim? It's supplemental for those two issues. If you have any other issues that you haven't filed before, that would be a new claim. Alan, when signing with H&P, roughly how long does it take for a fully develop a claim and submit? We don't uh, handle typically new claims. Uh, we would be submitting an appeal, a higher level review, or I guess a supplemental claim. And frankly, what we want to do first is get a copy of your full C file, <clears throat> see if there's evidence that needs to be submitted, see if there's evidence that was overlooked. Most likely there's going to be times where we'd want to go out and get a medical exam if there's not a thorough medical exam in there, or if there's a CMP exam, which we find to be faulty yet uh, uh, you know, adverse to your claim. So we can... As far as time, it just depends on how big of a file. I mean, if there's a brand new case, it should be a couple months. If it's something going back five, 10 years, it could be six months, nine months. I, I don't know. It varies from case to case. And when you file the appeal, you you need to make sure you're filing for the correct, mm -hmm. uh, is it effective date? Is it the rating? I mean, they're sort and by you need to look at the old file to figure out what you're filing correctly. So you can't just file an appeal. I, I hate it when I have to do that right away because it hasn't given me an opportunity to really see what's going on. All the issues. And yeah. All. Airborne Trooper, good to see you. Thank for, thank for all of you do. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe. Finger red button number one. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Because you obviously see we forget that all the time. <laughs> How long does it take, asks Michael, to get an HLR completed? That's a higher level review. Uh, there's no rhyme or reason. I've been sending out emails it's about 2022. It's it's crazy. It's like they lose some stuff. The more complex your case is, the higher it's going to take. The you know, if they get all bad CMP exams, great, they'll deny you right yeah. away. But I find out when they're going to give you benefits. A lot of times that takes longer because they actually have to figure out an effective date and a rating. But that doesn't mean just because they take a long time, you're going to win. Um, it's There's just no rhyme or reason with these people. It is all over the board. I mean, yeah. they're supposed to be about three months. And yeah, every uh, once in a while, we get one of those. Yeah, and we're it's like, a denial. Yeah, yeah, that's probably it. Um, but it's just been all over the board. But the trend that, that I've been seeing is in addition to Carol is that it's been taking longer and longer. The backup is happening. It's happened. Yeah. yeah. Pete, Peter, excuse me. I have service connection for hypertension, heart, rhinitis. I have AMD dry in my left eye and wet in my left eye. I'm thinking about filing a claim for my AMD secondary to hypertension heart. Is this worth pursuing? Yes, absolutely. Are you kidding? I would say to all service connected problems, let them figure it out. Mm. Don't limit yourself. Yeah, to just hypertension. Yeah. Remy 86, good to see you. Hello there. I was recently denied GERD secondary to PTSD. I didn't even put a claim for that. My claim was for GERD secondary to my service connected uh, MM, MDD, MTSS, headaches, and peripheral neuropathy. Uh, There's another part. Oh, okay. Medication side effects, weight gain, obesity. How would I approach presenting an appeal on this? Thanks a lot. That's great. You need to get the CMP exam because, and the medical opinion, because I'm betting that the medical opinion only talked about that one 
possible service connection and did not talk, talk about all the others. That's a clear high request for a higher level review because they failed to assist. They have a duty to assist in order to explore each one of the possibilities, not just one. Right. That. So I so get that going. The you know brief or, or discussion you want to have with the appeals officer is that that the CMP exam was inadequate and therefore a failure of the duty to assist to, to help you pursue your claim uh, because they did not explore all the different avenues that secondary service connection could have been granted. And list each one of those. Yeah. Okay. Lately, I've been getting medical opinions, just so you know, and it will have medical opinion number one, two, three, four, and five. And first I thought, is this person just rewriting it or what's going on? And then I looked at it and they're actually giving a separate. So maybe one medical opinion would have said in this case, sir, well, let's say service connections for headaches, secondary to sinusitis denied, uh, secondary to PTSD approved. So each one of those may, when you see a multiple medical opinions, they should be addressing separate possibilities for service connection. So Secondary look at all of them. Connection yeah. in your, in your uh, problem there. Angel, I was awarded 50% for sleep apnea on my initial claim through BSO who entered sleep apnea under golf four presumption. Now VA is proposing to sever sleep apnea due to clear and unmistakable error for no objective evidence. Uh, to sleep apnea and terror. What are my options? Uh, this is what they do all the time that drives me crazy. They are not allowed to do that. Clear and unmistakable error means there's no possibility. Uh, you're probably going to lose this at the regional office. Go to the board. I go directly to the board. Yeah, don't don't ask for high level. Review. Unless unless they didn't have a copy of your sleep apnea exam. If they uh, didn't have that, make sure they get that in. But if the reason is it's not service connected to Tara then go to the board. Okay. Yeah. So if it's, if it's the diagnosis they're saying you don't have, that's, that's proof what they're of. saying proof of, then, then give them that information. But if it's, they're saying there's no evidence it's related to <clears> what <throat> happened in service, then you go to the board. Twisted L, good to see you. Asked a question two weeks ago, Matt, the OSA rating criteria says such as found in Found that in the M21 adjudication manual, they're supposed to read this as a list that includes acceptable devices for 50%. The list is hidden there, I'm guessing on purpose, but it includes APAP, BPAP, CPAP, oral devices such as mouth guards. Look at that. I and didn't nasal. know that. Only stipulation is they must be on record as medically necessary devices, which they would pre be prescribed something if it's not necessary beyond <laughs> me. But yeah, they require an IMO or a note in the medical file saying this. So this is really interesting. He brought this up last I guess two weeks ago, just talking about how could a mouth guard get you 50%. And I said, I didn't know. I so appreciate you looking at that. And the M21, the M21, for those who haven't seen it, is the, basically the field manual, manual for the VA line adjudicators. They have to follow everything it says in there. And it's it's huge and it's uh, can be kind of difficult to look through. But that's really something if they're saying that a, a mouth guard, if, a, if it's prescribed by a doctor, uh, could get you the 50% level. I, I love that. I appreciate you sharing. I, I'm i glad and I want to look that up, but I just need you to know that there are different levels for sleep apnea. If you have a BiPAP, that's an 80%. Mm. So uh, I'm not sure what the mouth guard or what the others would be. The CPAP is supposed to be 50. So I know that they do give you different levels. Mm. WY Broncos. I was National Guard and on full-time National Guard duty operational support orders for military funeral honors. Can I claim an entry that happened while in these orders? Yes. And remember, for those of you who don't know, if, if a person is in, say, the Reserves or National Guard, they don't get the presumption of soundless soundness as people who are in the military do. So if you're in the military and you develop hypertension, you're consider that can be service connected. But if you're in the National Guards and you only have weekend duty or things like that, Dis disabilities like hypertension, heart disease are really, really unlikely to be awarded. An accident that occurs while you're actively engaged, that's that should be a, a no no brainer. Just make sure that's documented. Mm. Mad <clears throat> part one, due to pyramiding, am I am I rated for IBS and idiopathic rapid gastric emptying dumping syndrome together? Problem is that I'm rated at the max for IBS versus higher REG, which has separate rating and more serious symptoms. HLR sent back once due to no determination on the issue, had a new CMP exam 
examiner refused to use analogy and said she wouldn't check post gastronomy since I didn't have one. So RO did not use analogy either and just denied the higher rating of RGE. Who made the error and how do I word an appeal? Well, you definitely want to make sure your personal medical evidence that shows that is documented. That's the most important thing. If it's not in the file, you need to file a supplemental claim. If it's in the file, then I would appeal that to the board and point out why you're entitled to that rating. Yeah. So uh, what Matt's saying here is that with the diagnostic codes, there are gaps and the VA recognizes there's gaps in the diagnostic codes. So sometimes when they have uh, certain di diagnoses that are not in there, what they do is they rate those by analogy. So basically what they're doing is they're saying, even though, you know, you, um, you've got Parkinsonisms, we don't have that, but we have Parkinson's, so we're going to rate you that way. So here you have two different uh, GI issues and they're saying, well, even though they don't have the emptying syndrome on there, um, then we could rate it by IBS or we could rate it by the other one. It seems like the other the other diagnostic code is more advantageous. And even though you don't meet all the, the issues there, I would continue to fight for that and say that it should be rated analogously because the IBS diagnostic code does not contemplate how severely disabling this is for you. So doesn't cover all the symptoms that yeah. are included in the RGE. Yeah. So I, I would I, I would just basically say that that is not an adequate diagnostic code for your current disability. John, appeal or HLR the effective date? Intent to file February 23, filed for increase in October, lower back 0%, bilateral plantar fasciitis 10%, and new ANA for 70% mental health. Increase grant at 40% with bilateral radiculopathy at 10% each, 30% for feet, which make me 100% PNT. Also approved ANA, but VO effective date October for all, not February. This car. HLR. Right. So it's the HLR appeal, but do it within 30 days and ask for CAR. This is what Carol's talking about, where the higher level reviewers are very good. They get this part right. Right. You know, basically, this is this is a, a fundamental is uh, error they make on the rating, rating teams all the time for effective date, which blows our minds. They still make them, but for some reason, they're able to catch them, I think, a little bit easier at HLR. So yeah, the HLR is a, a much better place to get that. So HLR, but CAR within 30 days. Stephen, why should I go to you and not a VSO? Stephen, I think you should go to a VSO. Um, seriously, that, you, you know, we're, we're kind of the last resort, okay? You know, I, people ask me why should they pay an attorney money to get the benefits they deserve. I don't think you should. Um, you know, we, we actually turn away 94% of all the people that come to us. And one of the reasons is they need to file a new claim or they have the evidence already and they just need to do it themselves. Um, if you have the knowledge, look on our website, look, you know, look, look through past Q and A's like this, look at, look at the book that I've written. Uh, if you can do it yourself, do it yourself and, and go with the VSO. But what, what either way you go, just remember knowledge is power. And the more you know, not the attorney or you know the VSO, but the more you know, the more likely you are to get the benefits you deserve. I strongly suggest going to VSO first. If you find that you're banging your head against the wall and you're just not getting what you deserve and you feel like you've at the end of the rope, then seek an attorney. But don't go to an attorney first. But don't don't miss your appeals. Oh, yeah. The I one thing that. That, that saddens me is people will stay with the VSO or what they're doing. And often VSOs say, don't appeal this. You got 10 percent. Wait a year then come back. That is the wrong advice. I mean, mm -hmm. people lose years and years of benefits. So please make sure you continue your appeals. Uh, if you know, okay, an appeal 10, 10% for tinnitus, you're not going to get anything higher. Right. But if you have a basis for any of these other appeals, go with them, please. That's the one thing I see sad. I have people that come to me and I say, I can't get you benefits way back. You deserve them, but you didn't appeal. And so please don't let that happen to you. Best of luck to you. Railroad retired. Good to see you. Good <laughs> Thank afternoon. You. Best lover. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Uh, LMMF always. When is the deadline to apply for GERD under old statutes? When do the new standards take effect? Ooh, they just issued the new. This just came out this week. Let me pull this up. Actually, I've got it. So if you uh, haven't actually, applied. It came out literally today. Today. 
Um, and it's going to take effect on May, I believe May 29th of this year is when it's going to go into effect. So get your claim in right yeah. away because then you would get the benefit of the old one or the new one, whichever is better for you. If you wait and file till after that date in May, then you can only get benefits ratings according to the new one. You always want to get when this is when there's a changeover coming, you always want to get the benefit of whichever is better for you. So just so everybody knows, they proposed a new schedule of rating for the digestive system back in 2022. Uh, they had to have comments. They received comments and questions from the public on that. They finally, at literally today, uh, went through and revised all that and effective on, let's see, May 19th, 2024, there will be a brand new rating system for the digestive system. Not everything has changed, but they have made some changes in there. Twisted L, good to see you again. I want to file all claims and evidence myself so I stay in control. But would I be able to file a letter of representation with the VSO and only have them show me paperwork that I need to access ASAP, CMP reports and such? I don't know how they work. I don't know how they work. We don't work with VSO, so I really, I'm sorry, I don't know. I mean, they shouldn't be filing anything you don't want filed. And, and I, you know, if you're saying to file something, then I... And you should be able to, you should be able to get a copy. The VA should be sending you a copy of all decisions, but they don't send you a CMP exams. I have had some, not many of my clients tell me that the VSOs would not take the time to download the CMP exams because they were too busy. A few of them have. So I really don't know what this person would do, but I know if you write a letter to the VA and see, I need a copy of my CMP exam. Um, I'm finding that you're only asking for one thing. They're getting that out much faster, uh, often within a month or less. Michelle, zero percent for service connected for rhinitis and sinusitis. Recently diagnosed with bronchiolitis, bronchiolitis, uh, I messed that up. Can that be secondary to the above? And is the onus on onus on me to prove it to the VA? The onus on you is to prove it to the VA. I, I don't really, I'm not familiar whether that could cause it. It sounds like something it might, I'd have to Google that. Um, but yes, it's definitely your burden of proof. You can, they, they will give you a CMP exam. But I'm telling you most of them, uh, the ones that exams and the opinions, they're going to say, no, it's not related. You're going to have to show them the evidence, the medical uh, text treatises that show there's a relationship. All right, Jason, if a veteran is 100% PNT, PTSD, should they file for SMC? I forgot if it's S or K. Thank you. Well, you I, I always think, I think when veterans come to me, I'm getting them everything they're entitled to. And, you know, the, the thing about it is there's 100%, which pays about $3,600 a month. And then there's special monthly compensation, which can make that payment $10,000 and some. Well, so, not here. Huh? Not, not always. for PTSD. Not for PTSD, but if he has other problems, I'm saying whatever you have, you should go for it. Now, PTSD, you got 100%, you're not appealing that. So that's not in danger. So if you have other issues, say you have service-connected back problems or peripheral neuropathy that doesn't allow you to walk, those are things that are going to cause you to need aid and attendance, maybe loss of use of feet and hand. I don't really know what you have, but uh, get out the SMCs and see what Special monthly compensation are not necessarily I get it, that I get 10% more here or 20% more there. It means you meet a specific law that was passed that says, if you have total blindness, I'm going to give you more money. If you're not able to walk, I'm going to give you more money. So you want to look at what's being rewarded and see if you fit into any of those categories. One of them that we try to get our clients is if you have 100% for one thing and a combined rating of 60% for more, then you get SMCS. And that's a usual three to $500 more a month. Okay. Erectile dysfunction because of PTSD, which is very common. I just had a CMP exam that awarded that today. Mm. Um, that's, that's another $130 a month. So you want to look at the SMCs and see what you're entitled to. Yeah, I, I, the, the, you know, if you're not walking or you're, you can't use your hands, those are pretty big things. So you obviously have to go for uh, the, the more likely avenue you'd have here would be for the SMCS. If you have other disabilities that combine together for 60 percent independent of the PTSD, um, if you don't have that, you know, you're filing for hearing loss or tinnitus or scars. Yeah, that doesn't do it for me. I, I would just want to walk away from the system and not poke the bear. 
Um, but you know, you just have to judge for yourself. What are the extent of the disabilities you're suffering? And, and is that worth trying to get that extra three to $500 a month? And for anybody who has Parkinson's, mm -hmm. multiple sclerosis, um, peripheral neuropathy, any of the things that are going to really affect you in the future, file a claim for aid and attendance. Uh, aid and attendance is when, because of service-connected problems, you can't do the activities of daily living that keep you safe, like bathing, making your dinner, remembering your medication, okay? So file in a PTSD, you could need aid and attendance. A lot of veterans yeah. who have PTSD can't go out, they can't leave the house, they can't remember the medication. They forget to go to the doctor. That's aid and attendance for someone like that. Mm -hmm. So those are things that I really want because now before it used to be that if the record showed you needed aid and attendance, that was a claim. They're not doing that anymore. You have to actually file for aid and attendance. That's the effective date. So anybody who has any of those type of claims, file for aid and attendance and then see what else you're entitled to. Uh, so Coming to the right place. He needs advice, Matt. <laughs> Rich Rod, 1678. Uh, VA says they lost my rating letter and <laughs> I don't think they lost it for fun. My gut tells me there's important. My gut tells me there's important and my gut tells me that the VA doesn't want to see me. Uh, any advice, please? You're giving the VA far too much credit. Uh, yeah. They when, lose stuff all the time. Yeah, I, I mean, here's the thing. When it, when it comes to conspiracy or incompetence, I always go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, seriously, that, you know, for, for them. To conspire, Sorry for those of you who are really good. It's for those for them to conspire against you takes a lot of brain cells <laughs> and really a lot of thought and energy. And what I see a lot of times is just sheer incompetence. And so if they said they lost your letter, I mean, I, I don't know what to do about that other than file and say, this is the claim I filed and please make the decision. Give me a copy of my claim file. Cl claim file. Yeah. And let me start there it. and see what they've done in the claim file. But that's a pretty absurd. I mean, they made the decision, but okay. And I apologize to the VA people who work really hard. And there are some that there I love some. and boy, they help us every day. And to those, I say, thank you for what you're doing to the veterans, doing for the veterans. I call out some names, but I always worry I'll get people in trouble because they're so <laughs> helpful to us. <laughs> Kenton, I filed a total hip replacement and was awarded 10%. I appealed based on info <laughs> from your show and was awarded 50, but denied 10 hundred percent because I filed five months after the surgery. Are they wrong? I've never had that quite. Okay. I filed for total hip replacement. When you file for total hip replacement, you were putting them on notice. Okay. That, that you had a hip replacement and you were having surgery and they, sh I think they should have, uh, uh, I would appeal that. Yeah, I would too. What they're basically saying is because you didn't file, say I had surgery, want convalescence. How are you supposed to know you're supposed to use those words? Yeah. And, it, and, and now for the future for you, if you have surgery, you need to say, I have surgery and I'm asking for convalescence. Okay. But that's ridiculous. I would appeal it. Twisted L found out that I qualify for priority processing. Should I expect a difference in processing time or is it just another VA smoke screen to give the warm and fuzzies? If any effect, what is the average? Uh, priority can mean, it depends on where you are. Priority at the regional office, I would say maybe three months, maybe next week. Uh, at the BVA, I'm saying it's taken three to four months. Mm -hmm. uh, priority, um, remember, they still have to get a CMP exam. They still have to get it back. They have to look at it. So any nothing happens fast with the VA. But you're probably looking at three months. Hopefully. Definitely go with it. Remember, if you think you have, and I was on this kick along. When we first got this new form, remember the VA is moved by forms. Remember there's a request to expedite form at the VA office and that actually works. So you get the form out and you say, whatever reason that it qualifies you, I'm terminal, I'm suicidal, I'm homeless, any of the things that qualify you and the VA moves really fast on that. It's three months, but that's fast. Yeah. And if Nate, if you put up the form number for that, if we can find that, I'm sorry, I can't remember it. Jason, if a veteran does file again, 100% PNT, does that open new can of worms? Just depends on what's filed. Uh, if it's a totally separate claim right. from what's been granted, the from what the 100% has been granted, shouldn't. Uh, but if you, it could, you know, it should not. But if you file for something that's, you know, 
secondary to one of your conditions that's that you have the 100 for they could very well likely go back and look at that primary condition and, and try to re-rate that uh you just got to decide is that going to get you higher is it actually going to get you more than the 100 you're getting i would say 95 percent of the time i don't see any problem if you're 100 percent for one thing and you're filing for something totally different i don't see it um, I have, because the VA can be incompetent, seen them do that. And I have filed a letter of saying, we're withdrawing any claim you think we're making for PTSD and the veteran's not showing up because his only claims are this. And that's what I do just in case that happened to you. But if you're not touching that, I don't see any problem. Wyoming Broncos again, regarding National Guard on full-time National Guard operational support, Title 32 orders. Does this count as active duty for filing a claim? Now, Title 32, I'm assuming is for state service. Um, you have to be, you have to, uh, I, I don't know the answer to this. I, I don't mean, either, it, but it I think it's federal. federal. So if it's, if this does, if this chapter does speak to federal, then yes, that does count. But if you were activated by the governor, or the state that does not count. Not free enough. Sleep apnea. Is there any chance of getting 50% if sleep study says CPAP recommended instead of CPAP required? Ugh. I don't. What's the difference? If you're recommending a CPAP, I, I would say you be you need to be using it. Yeah. Let's say if you have the CPAP. Yeah. Like, that's that strong case. Bamboo. Pant Dolph, again, good to see you. Are widows entitled to their veteran spouse's disability benefits plus DIC or just DIC upon death of the veteran? Well, remember there, I'm sorry, I shook my head. They're not entitled to the veteran's monthly benefit that he was getting, but they're entitled to two things, depending on the evidence, DIC, which is dependent benefits and accrued benefits. So that means if the veteran had pending claims at the time of their death, then the widow or widower can pursue those and get those benefits that would have gone to the veteran. But the ongoing benefits or the benefit the veteran, you get the last month, the, the month that the veteran died in, you get those benefits, but any ongoing benefits are, go away. The only ongoing benefit would be the DIC. And DIC, there are two different numbers. One is around 1,600 a month, and the other is 1,950, I think. And the difference between that is, in order to get the higher rating, you have to show that the veteran was disabled 100% for at least eight years, and you had been married for at least eight years. Ask me where that came from. I have no idea, but that's eight years, 100% disabled, eight years married. Well, I mean, Broncos, is it pyramiding to claim depression caused by two different sources, one being full-time military funeral honors and second being to back pain? Nope. No, pyramiding is, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Pyramiding is, okay, you're asking for service connection. Uh, you can ask for service connection for a bunch of things secondary to whatever you're service connected for. Okay, that's not a problem. Pyramid is something different. When you have a rating, okay, say you have a rating for major depressive disorder and PTSD. If you tried to say, okay, I have 70% for major depressive and 100% for PTSD, you can't get that. You could either get the higher of whichever one you want, or it could be combined together. But you have to show that there's different symptoms. Like if it's a pulmonary problem and you um, have problems breathing, but you also have sleep apnea, they're probably not going to let you do that. That's going to be pyramiding because it's the breathing that symptoms that are uh, pro a problem. Yeah. Pyramiding goes to symptomatology, not service connection. Right. John had a higher level review and it was a show. They didn't ask me one question. Is that right? I'd yeah, that's typical. Yeah. And just to kind of elaborate on that, when we have higher level review conferences, we go in with an agenda. We want to make sure they have X, Y, Z evidence. We want to make sure they've looked at this and we want to point out what we thought was either wrong with their CMP examiners lacking or why our evidence was better and, and why the service connection should be there. We don't expect them to ask questions because honestly, they probably haven't even read the file. Right. We try to, we don't, we don't like having the hearings. It, it is so infuriating because uh, I happen to work a lot of weekends, like all weekends. And so I get these calls. So when you ask for a hearing for a higher level review, I would get my call on Saturday or Sunday, think, they thinking that I'm not working. And so it's ridiculous because they'll say, as they deny you, called, no response. 
So what we've tried to do is now we actually write in the appeal exactly what the evidence is we want them to see and why. Uh, it was just really frustrating with these hearings. So they just didn't work. Yeah. But I mean, every attorney is different. Some find this works for them, but I just found it was just really frustrating. And if I had everything in writing, I got to say what I wanted to say, no matter when they called. And it's part of the record. Yes. <clears throat> Shemp, for mental health, specifically anxiety, are you seeing a lot of 10% ratings or mainly 30% and above? It all depends on what the examiner yeah. says. It, you know, They're going to go with whatever the examiner says. What you want to make sure is you have, if you have health records from a psychologist, you want those records to show how bad your condition is. And always, always put in a statement on a 4138 yourself talking about when it started, how bad it is, how it affects you in every phase of your life, detailed. You want that from a witness as well. When you get those in the record, they may not help you at the regional office, but they're going to help you at the board. So please, this is your case. You need to document it. Only you know mm -hmm. how bad it is and the things that really bother you. Get the rating out. The rating will tell you if you only have this problem, you get 10%. If you have these problems, say panic attacks, you're going to get this percent. So if you get that rating out, it may, may remind you of all the things you have and you will list all of them. The biggest error my clients make just have, is if they have suicidal ideations, I don't want to live, life isn't worth living, I think about it. Not that you're necessarily going to do it, but it's part of your life. That's a 70% rating. If you get that down in writing, you've really made a good point on your case. And if you get your people who are around you saying, I'm worried he's going to kill himself because he's just so sad and life is not what he wanted it to be. Those that's how you prove your case. And remember, you've seen a doctor tell them all these things. So many of my clients are afraid their guns are going to be taken away or they're going to be locked up. That's not going to happen. That happens if you say right now, I'm going to go out and kill myself. That's not what you're talking about. It's a whole different thing. I'm on a, I'm on a rant on. today. No, I just work here. <laughs> M Brooks 33. Hello. I submitted a claim for aggravated asthma. I filed for breathing problems in 2014 and was denied. Should I have done a supplemental claim for the 2014 denied claim? I noticed on my denial that they did not have a medical history of my in-service event for asthma. So that's two different things there. Yes. If you filed a claim before you need to file a supplemental claim now. If they did not have information of your what happened in service, you need to get a copy of your claims file and submit whatever evidence was there. Frankly, if they didn't have that back in 2014 and you're submitting it now, you've just reopened that claim all the way back to 2014. So that's really valuable information. Yeah, sometimes our veterans actually have service medical records that don't yeah, appear in the right. file. And if you turn those in, then like Matt said, that could open it back to 2014. I love those cases. Yeah, those are fun. Making them pay. Making them pay. EJ, is it true that VA clinics don't communicate when it comes to gathering evidence for VA claims? Communicate and VA, those, those, are, <laughs> those are two words not in the same sentence very often. I think you got to start there. As far as VA clinics, the onus is on the VA benefit administration to go to those clinics and, and extract the information. Um, the clinics themselves don't necessarily have to put it forward, but the VA benefit administration has access to all those records, and those records should be associated with the claims file for your current case. Yeah, but remember, you need to tell them which VA yeah, you've true. been to, because um, if you don't tell them, they're not gonna get them. Right. And you need to tell all of them, all the places you've been to. Will, 0% bilateral hearing loss. Should I apply for SMCK? Can you get K for hearing loss? I don't think A you 0%? can. A 0%? No, I don't, I don't think you can do that. And Hearing loss is one of the hardest things to get a any rating other than zero percent. It, it is really, really hard. So unless you are really deaf, you got a hearing aid, you still can't hear very well. I would work on other claims that you have because it's just frustrating. You're still going to get ten percent. Yeah. Michael, good evening. Uh, do either one of you know anything about Congressman Bacon Bill about? Uh, MST back pay. I haven't seen that of you. I have not either. I'd no. be interested to know more about that, Michael, if you have a copy of the bill or a name. And I'm sure you've heard many times we as vets are getting the stimulus. Hmm. Not sure what that means. 
Tigerbyte, hello, I submitted a claim for increase for PTSD and filed for TDIU. While they did combine the claims, how do they determine which one to grant? They can grant both of those or either one of those. Or neither. Yeah. And uh, it just depends on what the evidence is from the CMP examiner. And for TDIU, if you did not turn in an 8940 form, they're not going to grant TDIU. The 8940 form shows when you worked and when you stopped work and why you couldn't work. You're supposed to fill that out and send it in. So I've had a lot of clients that have filed for TDIU on their own, but didn't send in the form. You're going to be denied. Mm -hmm. Chow, one of two. Should I file higher level review if the CMP exam did not complete a full DBQ? I indicated radiculopathy when I filed for an increase, but during the exam, I was only asked about the symptoms. No testing to follow, and it never was factored when they made the decision. I even called the VA after the exam to submit a complaint. Thank you for all that you do. Yeah, I, I, if they inadequate exam, again, this is a duty to assist error. They have a duty to assist you to, to win your claim, and if they're not doing a a thorough or frankly even adequate exam, then they need to do that again. So your argument is they failed to complete their duty to assist by giving you an inadequate CMP exam. But but where I would have, this is what we do. When we get the CMP exams, we send them to our veterans and ask them if they feel that's accurate. If it's not, in writing on a 4138, we have we write up what the veteran has to say and have him or her sign it and submit it. Because you called that doesn't mean that that shows yeah, up in your exactly. exam. So as a basis of their failure to uh, duty to assist, you really need to put this in writing and let them know exactly how they didn't, they didn't measure me for range of motion. They never even touched or looked at my legs. You know, those are, those are horrible uh, things that, that make it an inadequate exam. They can't rely on something like that. Michelle, again, is TDIU based solely on service-connected disability or other issues that have not been filed? Solely on service-connected. Yeah. When, and where you may get mixed up in that is there's pension. Remember, pension is for a veteran who served during time of war and has a income under whatever the current limit is. I'm not yeah, sure. Uh, and then that person, they will count any problem you have if you're not working, whether it's service-connected or not. So that's maybe where you're mixed up on that. But to get TDIU, which is like $3,600 a month, you have to show it's service related to service connection. MNL, MNL Phil 84, what's your thoughts on CMP exam done by a PA of two separate disabilities? Vertigo and sleep apnea. Is it normal or favorable for the veteran? It's got to be pretty normal. It's pretty normal. I don't know. I wouldn't call it favorable or unfavorable, frankly. I just call it that's their new norm. They're just getting nurse practitioners, PAs, um, you know, doctors. They pay $75 or that's what they used to for these exams. And so they can't get a lot of doctors to do it for that. Yeah. So you're getting a lot of PAs. I've seen some really favorable PAs and really awful PAs. Yeah. But I mean, same thing with doctors. Yeah. <clears throat> like my gaming. I first attempted to file in 2020, but COVID happened and stopped seeing people in person. And since it's been difficult to obtain medical insurance, how much would this affect my claim? Medical insurance would not affect your claim at all. They have a duty to get you to a doctor, CMP exam or PA, like we just said, and, and look at the issues you believe are related to service or look at your service connected issues and see if they should be rated higher. So you don't need medical insurance for that. And, and you should be able to treat at the VA as well to, to, go for to you know tame these ongoing problems well you say that i'm not quite sure what your question is you attempted to file the claim in 2020 if you actually filed the claim but had difficulty appealing it or pursuing it because of covid there is um they have been granting an exception to that you would have to file you had to have filed a claim but if you had a problem processing it after that you need to file an appeal saying that I wasn't able to file the appeal timely because of COVID. You have to put that in your appeal and they may give you an exception for that. That's worth doing for the yeah. effective date. Carlos went to CMP on February 13th, got an email last week from Optum. They said that the system said they needed another opinion and that I would not need to attend a CMP. It would be a medical review only. Is this common? Yes. When, when the, first opinion is inadequate. Sometimes it's sent back to the doctor to explain more or to look at different questions. Um, and a lot of times it's, you're not needed 
to be there in that process. But I would also say sometimes the opinion is favorable and they don't want one. I have found this in a number of cases. They ask for another opinion and they pose it so that they know they're going to get a negative opinion. So I would ask for a copy of both yeah. medical opinions. And if you're denied, then you file for a higher level review saying that they had a duty to consider all evidence favorable to you. Mm. Uh, and I've had that enough in the last few months to make me a little suspicious. <laughs> all right. Dirt Road Dreamers, my in-service medical records from 82 to 90 are lost. I turned into my local VA hospital in 90. How do you file for conditions only annotated in those records? Are they still in the, does the local VA hospital have them? That would be great if they did, because uh, that would be part of your, your C file. Yeah. And I would go to the hospital and say, I turned them in. I want to know, do they still have paper records? Do they scan everything? Mm -hmm. uh, but unfortunately, I tell my veterans, never send your only Delicious. copy to the VA, they lose everything like that. You always need to keep a copy, please, please. So I'm worried that you may not be able to find these. Yeah. I, um, the only other avenue you'd have would be buddy statements. Yeah. You know, if you had friends from service, even friends out of service who knew you while you were there, who saw something happened or noticed a change in you, that's really your route to go if, if you don't have the records. All right, Will. Denied MST, but CMP examiner opined on insomnia, indicating reason long work hours. Why would they do this? So they're going to give you service connection for insomnia, which is under the mental health rating code. So you're going to be helped. You're going to be rated there. I don't know why they would do that. I don't know. I've seen them do that lately. I don't know if there's some new issue coming out. But then you want to ask for an increased rating because of depression caused by insomnia. Right. So what Carol's saying here is, you know, they got the name wrong. They got what was service, the issue that was service connected wrong. They're calling it something else. But at the end of the day, we're talking about getting you compensation, service connected compensation. So if they're rating you on the mental health uh, diagnostic code already, which is where insomnia is, just go with what Carol said and say, no, this is actually worse because I have depression due to the insomnia versus you trying to establish that the MST is related. I know it sounds weird, but at the end of the day, what we want for you it's the compensation, not the title. Okay. So I would, uh, you know, don't appeal the, the, the service connected part. Remember what you want is service connection. Once you get service connection, you can work with that. Yeah. Okay. All right. We got time for about two more questions here. And before that, remember, we want to encourage you. We, we are trying because there's the VA is just so complex. We're trying to send out uh, our newsletters that have a lot of information that's really important to you. So if you sign up for those and you're part of the newsletter, we're going to start off our questions every week with several questions from them right away. Um, because once you look at the newsletter, a lot of times maybe your questions will be answered and it'll help you more. It helps us too to know what you guys need more information on. Right. All right. Laughing L-O-M-F always. If you take... Oh, Amesprazole. For, for GERD and helps. Are you no longer eligible to receive compensation if hearing loss in the VA gives you hearing aids? No, they're supposed to rate you not related to the GERD. Um, that's what they're supposed to do. Not, not related, related to, to the, the drugs, medication right, and how right. that affects you. The hearing aids, um, I I thought they tested you without the, the hurry. They're I supposed to test you without the hearing aids. Yeah. So you should be still getting service connected yeah. compensation for that. I can't read that. I, Dover Tassel LLC. Uh, I applied for migraine secondary to tinnitus. It was denied. I had a DBQ and a good nexus that also service connected migraines to allergic rhinitis with studies. On the decision, it said they used Terra. Oh my God. Okay, this is what we're seeing lately. Should they have considered my rhinitis <laughs> secondary? Yes. Yes, it's due to assist Terra. Um, Terra has nothing to do with what you're claiming. Tara is basically like our, saying that you were exposed to a chemical that's not in the area where they're admitting chemicals were uh, were used or, you know, exposure to veterans happen. It has nothing to do with whether your current service connected disability is causing a secondary one. So that, yeah, that's failure to do to assist, honestly, to understand your claim. Uh, but, <laughs> but this is what we're seeing. It's like the Congress grants you benefits and the VA finds a way to screw you on them. Yeah. All right. So Congress said, look, you've got to start saying what these veterans were exposed to. And so they're sending out terror members and they were saying exposed to herbicides in Vietnam, yes or no, exposed to this in Iraq, yes or no. And so that is one way you can get service connection. 
but they didn't even understand your claim. They're just, I am seeing so many examiners just say they were not exposed to toxins and therefore their hearing is not service connected. I mean, just ridiculous things. Right. So, and, and for you to have a secondary service connection has no, right. What happened in service doesn't matter at this point. So duty to assist, yeah. but you need to point out to these people. So they understand I filed for service connected based on this, not on toxins. Right. You did not assist me. I need a new exam. Yeah, Make it I mean, clear. You have to help them help you, basically. <laughs> yeah. you know, they're supposed to be doing this. Um, sorry, folks, we had a late start today. and We, we, we uh, can't go for much more time. However, we've got a treat. Uh, Nate, the, the Wizard of Oz, the man behind the curtain, is always telling me I need to do more videos. And there's more stuff out there that you guys need to know. And I just don't have the time. So finally, I said, Nate, I just why don't you do it? And so Nate is coming out from behind the curtain. And this <laughs> week he has released his first series of videos. His first one is on when and how you get paid and how the benefits work. You know, it's obviously it's never uh, what day of the month you're supposed to get paid. What that day is it that for this month or the month before. And so Nate put out this first video. So I'd love it if you guys watch it and give us some comments, some feedbacks. Is it great? Does he have a face for the radio like me? Is it something we should do more for the of? radio? Yeah, face for the radio. You've never heard that? No. Yeah, well. That's what they say about people on the radio. Um, anyway, but but please check it out. Let us know what you think. There, there's so much more information we want to give you all, and there's only so much time we have in the day. And uh, and, and deploying Nate in this way, hopefully, uh, gets get you guys some of that. Be nice to Nate. Nate was sitting at his kitchen table or sitting in his home working when a car drove right into into his house. Yeah. So he's had a few tough months. Yeah, he has. But anyway, thank you all so much. We look forward to seeing you on the space next week. And uh, enjoy this video. Take care. I'm going to be talking about payment rates, when to expect them, and how all that's going to work. First things first, uh, if you are to get service connected and get a VA compensation disability payment, it's paid monthly. And it's essential to know that the payment you receive each month is for the month prior. For example, when you get paid in February, you're being paid for January. March is for February, so on and so forth throughout the rest of the year. So if you're expecting January's payment, it will be coming in February. Now, the VA typically deposits payments on the first business day of each month, but quick little heads up, if the first day of the month falls on a weekend or a holiday, the payment is made on the last business day before the first. So keep an eye on your calendar to know exactly when that will be. The most efficient way to receive your payments is through direct deposit. It's secure and funds are usually available sooner compared to traditional mail. So if you haven't already, consider signing up for direct deposit unless you're the type who likes good old fashioned checks and then you'll get them in the mail. When it comes to planning ahead for your finances, we have a pretty detailed little table that outlines each month's payment date for 2024 and the corresponding day of the week for your convenience. This will help you know exactly when funds will be available to your account, allowing you to manage your expenses and budget accordingly. This table right here is the one that we're using, the one that's floating right here in space that the editor definitely put in, got each day. I'm just giving you time to read it at this point. If it's awkward for you, trust me, it's awkward for me. Last thing, cost of living adjustments or COLA, it's going to be reflected in these payments. That's the government's way of ensuring that your benefits keep pace with inflation every year. The COLA amount was announced in October of 2023 for the year of 2024. You can watch our video on that right here if you'd like to learn more about what COLA for 2024 is. Now, if at any moment you want any of this information right at your fingertips, we've provided the links below for you to be able to click through any of them to figure out what your payment schedule will be. This graph that you saw here is available in the description and it's going to help you figure out when to expect getting paid. So if there are any problems or delays in your payment, you know when it should have come so you can reach out to the VA to make sure that you are acquiring your money on a timely basis. And there you have it. There's a very brief but comprehensive guide on the 2024 payment schedule so you can better plan your finances this year. It's easy to stay on top of it if you know what's going to happen. If you like this video, please consider hitting that subscribe button below. We would love for you to join our community in which we give away tons of free information on how to get service connected for your disabilities. We talk A to Z, a whole bunch of information here on this channel and as well as our website. We've got calculators and we've got toxic exposure maps. We've got information on PACTAC. We've got it all. There's a bunch of links in the description below for you to be able to click through and find other things. You can download our ebook or use our VA disability calculator. All this is free to you. We want you to be able to get the VA benefits that you deserve. So please consider subscribing today. And as always, thank you for watching. And before you go, there's a video right here if you want to go ahead and click that and watch it. It's up to you though. You don't have to, but.